Hey there, Hour of History podcast listeners. This is your host, Stephen Bauman, and this is the Hour of History podcast. This week, I have with me Dr. Sandy Holguin, who has written a new book coming out June 11th, 2019. It's called Flamenco Nation, The Construction of Spanish National Identity. I actually saw this on Twitter. I saw the cover. It's, it's a very impressive looking image, and I just love when historians take something from popular culture and and cultural these sort of outputs like music and dance and and look at how it's formed national identity i think it's a fantastic sort of project and i knew that it would be a great conversation so i think you're going to enjoy it whether or not you are a dancer you're going to want a flamenco after this. Uh, thanks so much for listening to Hour of History. You can subscribe at hourofhistory.com forward slash subscribe. On Hour of History, it's our world, anytime, any place. Enjoy. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast, our world, anytime, any place. For show notes, links, and more, be sure to visit our website at www.hourofhistory.com. And for all the book recommendations made during the podcast, head over to ourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's ourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. Without further delay, your Hour of History starts right now. And welcome to the Hour of History podcast. Uh, with me right now is Dr. Sandy Olguin. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. How about yourself? I'm doing very well. Um, and as I mentioned in the intro, it was uh, so fascinating to see this book coming out, Flamenco Nation. Um, before we get to the book, though, can you tell us a little bit about your background and, and sort of what brought you to history, what brought you to Spain, and so on and so forth? Ah, this is a long, a long detailed question then. <laughs> so I, when I was a kid, uh, during the early 70s, uh, right before the death of Franco, I was living in Spain. My uh, family moved there for work. And so we traveled a lot when we were there and traveled a lot in Europe. Then I came back to the States. And uh, when I was in Spain, I was fascinated by all the old buildings and, and all the history there, which made me realize later on that that was something that I liked, which is old things and history. And I uh, ended up studying history as and English as an undergraduate at UCLA and then ended up going to graduate school in European history. And it was European cultural and intellectual history because I wanted to do a kind of history that dealt with cultural things, kind of linking my English major with the history major and so I got into it that way, and then I ended up working in Spain because I had these fond childhood memories of Spain, and because very few people actually studied Spanish history, at least modern Spanish history in the United States. Hmm. And it, it is kind of a unique perspective then to have that background. Um, do you remember sort of getting a, a Spanish perspective, if you will, on things when you were growing up, or were you in a pretty American community? Well, I went to an American school as a kid. I mean, I was only, what was I, nine years old and 10 years old. So I was pretty young. Mm. And so I didn't really have a sense of Spain in the way that, let's say, my older brother did or anything like that. But what I had a sense of was uh, sort of the people, what the place looked like, what it smelled like. Um, and th this idea of you know being able to see castles and, and touch walled cities and things like that was just fascinating to me. So it was more the almost tactile quality and visual quality of history that appealed to me. And then, um, you know, I came back to the United States and those memories, it was just these great childhood memories of traveling that really got to me. Mm. And it's, it's always fascinating to hear like how these kind of things start, um, especially because, you know, we never know where we're going to end up, but, but you had a, a love for literature as well. You mentioned you studied English too. Yes, I did. Which, and, if you had talked to me when I was a, a smaller child, I, I would have laughed. I think I asked, why do people become English majors? But then I ended up really loving literature. So it was just great. And then I think my senior year in college, I, I was, took an intellectual history class. And I thought, this is what I love to do, dealing with ideas and, um, and reading literature. And 
and um, it kind of got me in, in that track. I didn't even know there was such a thing as cultural intellectual history till my senior year in college. And I thought, this is what I want to do. Mm. And I was always better at history than, in, than I was at English in terms of analyzing the kinds of sources you analyze in both disciplines. So I thought this was, that history was a better fit for me. Interesting. It seems like a lot of people who study Spain are drawn to this intellectual history um, because there's such a rich literature tradition. Um, what really drew you to the intellectual aspect of this? Uh, it wasn't actually, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, it wasn't the, <laughs> the intellectual history of Spain. I was, I mean, I really was trained as a European cultural and intellectual historian. So mm. I read widely in European um, literature and um, in intellectual history. And then I just decided, well, there isn't that much done, at least in the United States, uh, in terms of cultural history and intellectual history. So that thought in terms of Spain. So I thought, well, this would be a nice niche to have. Yeah. Not realizing that the academic market wasn't very um, big for modern Spanish historians. Mm -hmm. And so that is, I mean, it's a fair observation that it seems that there's something that Americans at least are hungry for is this cultural connection. Um, now, I, the flamenco, that really, you know, was interesting to me. Nationalism, national identity, these always grab my attention. But recently, I went to the uh, Washington, D.C., the open house of the Embassy Day. And mm -hmm. each nation kind of got to put forth this identity. They had to decide, you know, what are we going to show that shows our nation? And I think that was one thing that when I saw someone had retweeted your cover or something and it ended up on my Twitter feed, I was like... This is very interesting. So can you talk a little bit about uh, first maybe Spanish national identity and then we can warm our way to how flamenco fits in. But what, what is Spain? <laughs> <laughs> now, if I could answer that, I'd be rich. <laughs> I'd be invited to lots of places. That's the, that's the, the funny thing, right? Because what, what I said in my book and what I always say is when people think of Spain, at least in this country, they think flamenco dancers, bullfighters, mm. tapas, and people throwing tomatoes at one another, <laughs> right? Uh, if you got, want to get more historical, there's the black legend of Spain, which is, you know, that there are a bunch of bloodthirsty conquistadores. And that's, these are all, of course, wrong, because these are just stereotypes of a nation. Mm. But in terms of Spanish national identity, there have been these big conflicts about, you know, did it have a strong national identity? Does it have a strong national identity? Because you have had it because the Spanish state itself, although it was intact, you know, from the early modern period on, it was still a highly regionalized country. And in the 19th century, there were attempts by the, the crown and the government to centralize Spain more and to create some kind of national identity that people could aspire to. But there's always been these tensions with these regional identities that are in constant conflict with this centralizing national identity. And you can see these ebbs and flows of identity in the 19th and 20th centuries and the 21st century if, you're, if you've been keeping up with the Catalan nationalism and Basque nationalism in Spain to this day. Yeah, and so this is a issue I see always when we're talking nationalism. It's kind of like well, how, f how far back are we going to take this? And, and you mentioned 19th century, but um, we're really talking like, like the long 19th century, right? Um, going back to the same time when we have like sort of the foundation of um, even American identity and things like that. Um, so where do you start when you start your sort of discussion about Spanish national identity? Well, I think I start where a lot of people do, which is with the French Revolution, mm. or what they call in Spain, the War of Independence. Because I think the French Revolution was very big in creating at least these kinds of national identities that were in opposition to the French Revolution and the occupation of, of the French on Spanish territory. So you begin to see some of these kinds of things in the late 18th and early 19th century. And then, of course, with Romanticism in the early 19th century, you're going to see a lot of uh, this kind of nationalism, but it's more of a cultural nationalism than some sort of political nationalism that becomes stronger as you go uh, further along in the 19th century. 
but most people um, are still very regional. You know, one of my favorite books, speaking of UCLA, that I read in college was Peasants into Frenchmen. Oh, yes. Um, and, you know, it's, it's so, can, how, how diverse is Spain? What are we talking about here? Oh, it's very diverse. And mm. it, was, it was in the 19th century and it is today. You have what are known as sort of the historical regions of Spain, which are, are historical nationalisms of Spain, which is the Catalonia, the Basque Country, and Galicia. But you have other movements in the late 19th and early 20th century in places like Andalusia and in, um, sorry, I'm blanking here for a second. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Valencia, who are also talking about autonomous movements as well. But yes, it is, it is very regional. And what's interesting is once you get to the Franco era in the post-Spanish uh, Civil War, you have groups that tried to folklorize these regional identities as a way of consolidating a national identity. It's mm. a way called domesticating regional nationalisms at the service of a centralizing nationalism. Hmm. And so these identities that they're trying to create, it's, it's just a great conversation to have with people, I think, especially now, because there's this sort of, at least, um, maybe I'm misreading people, or maybe this is even a little arrogant to say, you know, there's, I don't, I'm not scientifically polling people, but it seems like we kind of and as understand nations to have been there always, but I, I love works that kind of show you how how contentious some of these things are um and culture varies among these groups so you're taking a cultural activity and how does that interact with different groups in spain okay well so we all if you know anything about flamenco people assume that it is well actually this is two things people assume flamenco is all spanish if you're not living in Spain, but if you're living in Spain, flamenco is seen as a, an art form that comes out of Andalusia or Andalusia, Southern Spain. Hmm. But it's one of those products of what I would say, product of mass culture that it disseminates very quickly in the late 19th century and early 20th century to all the regions of Spain. And it does so despite the fact that elites in Spain really do not like that representation of Spain as the land of flamenco. Hmm. It, for them, it is a stereotype that they keep trying to escape. And so what is it? What is flamenco and why is it so, uh, why don't they want it? Well, again, for most Americans, if you see it, if you've ever seen a flamenco performance, you automatically assume it's about dancing only. Hmm. And it, it's generally perceived as something that's a very sexual and sensual dance and passionate. You can, you know, you can always see the word passionate when you see descriptions mm -hmm. of and fiery and, and the, the Spanish word duende, like this kind of soul that comes out of people. But uh, within Spain itself, actually, those who think of themselves as flamenco aficionados really think of the song, the singing as more important than the dancing. Mm -hmm. That's changed some, I think, in the second half of the 20th century, but it was really associated with the voice. But when flamenco dance and song was first performed in the, like in public, in cafe, can, cafes cantantes, which are like, you know, taverns, bars, show places for flamenco performances, these were generally in places that were in kind of seedy sections of town. They were done by gitanos or gypsies a lot of the time. And so these were people that were considered despised people in, in a lot of parts of Spain. And so it was seen as a, a lower class, uh, kind of the work of prostitutes and people uh, who were vice ridden and people who went to see these things were not supposed to be you know, good bourgeois people, even though lots of good bourgeois people saw these performances. But it was equated with pornography for mm. a lot of and early 20th century, very similar to way, the way the tango was, was um, viewed in Argentina in the early years, and the kind of relationship between more elite cultures and the cultures of flamenco were very similar to those of the blues and jazz in the United States. So there are all these kinds of similar 
uh, processes that are going on in modernizing countries. Wow. And so what are the elites doing at this time? How are the elites disconnected so that are, are some elites still going to these uh, cafes contantes or oh, are everybody's going to them, but you've mm. got the people who, I mean, especially aristocrats, there's this link between aristocrats and the, these cafes cantantes, but it's the, the middle classes and a lot of the bureaucrats and people like that. And the image makers in Spain, and of course the Catholic church and conservatives who are very opposed to this. And what happens and what I talk about in my book is that there is this, a kind of feedback loop that's going on. You have foreigners who come to Spain and they see these performances and then they go back to their countries and write about them. And they say, this is the Spanish soul and this is what they're like. And there's this, these primitive people, but they're passionate. They're pre-industrial, but we love them. And then of course, more people from those foreign countries come in to Spain and, and then they, you know, they, write some more about these experiences. And then you get these people in the cafes cantantes that cater to a kind of incipient tourist industry. Mm. Then you have these other people like conservatives in the Catholic church or, you know, writers, it, Spanish writers who say, this is not Spain and we want to be modern. And so there's just this conflict that's going on. And so eventually by the time you get to the 1950s, when the Franco is trying to get a tourist, uh, uh, tourist industry going they finally decided to like just bring in all the stereotypes you can to bring people in <laughs> and so that so I, I see it as a feedback loop in many respects and along the lines of of different regional groups how how is this art form uh moving because it, its origins are kind of in southern spain right mm -hmm. and so so how does it get to catalonia or galicia uh, it, it gets there through the sort of performance capitals. It goes through Madrid, any kind of, just think of New York in the United States. Anything that's going to be big goes through New York first and maybe Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So these things would start in, in Andalusia, but Madrid is the capital. So if you want to make it in the capital uh, and you want to make it big or you want to make it on the international stage, you go to Madrid. And then you had people also going to Barcelona, but then they just disseminated to all the major cities and all these towns and that's kind of how it diffused, just like most popular culture or mass culture in that period. And do you it was, find... It was, it was oh. urban more than rural. Uh, and do you find that in these urban areas, um, they're the first ones to kind of champion it as a as an identity thing? Like, does Barcelona sort of try to lay claim to it before Madrid? Or is there tension there? Oh, no, there's tension. In fact, in one of the chapters I talk about because in the late 19th or early 20th century, you have all of these migrants from Southern Spain to Barcelona to work um, that, and that the music comes with them, that you get a backlash from Catalan nationalists who tried to promote Catalan regional music mm -hmm. and song. So this is the debate that they end up having. And in Barcelona itself, the places where flamenco was performed were in the really seedy sections of the city. And so this, form was associated with foreigners because the Catalans considered the Andalusians foreigners and Catalan nationalists kept trying to promote their own sorts of regional identities. And so the Sardana was one of the, the big, the big uh, Catalan dance was the thing that they promoted against this filthy flamenco. Hmm. And so there, there was clear, people knew what was happening as far as cultural formation and identity. It was being weaponized or used, not weaponized maybe, but um, manipulated very yes, early very, on. very much so. Very yeah. much so. And speaking of foreigners, one of the things Spain obviously has a lot of connections to is, is to the Western Hemisphere. Um, so how did Spain use flamenco in terms of, of its relationship with between East and West, between uh, Europe and the Latin America or abroad? What, what did flamenco show to the world? Well, it depends on when you're talking because I, don't, I didn't end up writing about flamenco in Latin America. This, this project got too big as it was. Mm. I limited mostly to Spain. But when you get to the 1960s, I would say, Mm. that's when flamenco gets promoted by the 
state in a kind of soft diplomacy. So the big um, time where they really start to show up is 1964, 1965 at the New York World's Fair. Oh. Now they did the kinds of things also in Parisian World's Fairs earlier on, but this is kind of this worldwide attempt to bring in tourists to Spain. And so this 1964 and 1965 World's Fair was the place where they really brought the best talent from Spain, uh, flamenco uh, singers and dancers and guitar players. And they had performance guides to talk about the history of flamenco so that people could know what they were seeing. So I would say that it's from there, from that period on, from 64, 65 on is when it really takes off on the international stage. Now, do you get into, in the book, do you talk about uh, transitions and or sort of analysis of flamenco as an art form? Um, not too much. Okay. I am I am not a dancer. I am not a musicologist. <laughs> I'm, I'm really a historian. So what I was looking more at was how people looked at flamenco as a way of talking about national identity in Spain, either as this is our national identity or this is something we're trying to fight against. And so that's really how I was looking at it. Uh, interesting. And you've written before about national identity and Spain certainly in the 20th century goes through a whole lot of significant events and changes in terms of national identity. Um, how, how does it change from, say, the Restoration to the Republic through the Civil War? Can you just, uh, maybe some highlights? I mean, it's a ton of history, right? But <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> let's see. How do I even deal with that question? Yeah, why, why, don't, we start with, why don't we start with sort of like, I, I think a lot of people tend to forget about Spain, you know, I don't know, or just not think about Spain in this like sort of monarchy right. era. Right. Between 1588 and 1936, there's no Spain <laughs> generally. <laughs> it pops up every once in a while in the history books, but yeah. Finally in 1936 with the Spanish civil war, it's, it's big again for a little bit. On the time. map. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in the, in the era, like in the 19th century from the restoration, let's say 1875, um, to what, 1936 or 19, okay, so from 1875, 1976 to 1923, before the restoration breaks down, there you have a relatively stable monarchy there, um, but they're still fighting colonial wars. And then we basically the big year for Spain in this period is 1898 when it loses the Spanish American War. And you have everybody and their mother talking about why Spain is a failure and how did mm. Spain regenerate again. 1898 is the big year, as I said. So you have people in the military, politicians, the Catholic Church, uh, anarch well, anarchists, not so much, socialists, all of these people talking about, well, anarchists do, why, why is Spain a failure? Why did it lose this war? It was once this great power, how do we gain it back? And so then you have these various groups of people who decide that there are various ways the Spanish nation should be. And then this is called the regenerationist movement. It's this broad term to talk about all these different ways to think about how to make Spain a strong nation again. And so you have those that decide that they need to emulate Northern Europe and become industrialized and modern and get rid of the Catholic church. You have a Catholic sort of imperial tradition where people say, no, our greatest strength was when we had, Ferdinand and Isabel and Philip II, and we had an empire and we were Catholic and we knew who we were. And then you have these other nationalist groups like the Catalans and the Basques who were saying, no, we need to be either autonomous or independent. And that Spain is of this giant weight that's keeping us down. Hmm. And basically you have this battle between, between kind of decentralizing nationalisms and centralizing nationalism that take place in the, during the Spanish Civil War. 1936 and 1939 and then the nationalists under Franco win in 1939 and there are these big campaigns to talk about you know one great Spain and to try to unify it under um, military try to regain some kind of empire even if it's a cultural empire and uh, to make sure that people don't talk about regional nationalisms again and that you're strongly Catholic so they're going back to this kind of identity 
that's in the past until you get to the later Franco years in which they want to be considered both traditional and modern. And then all of that breaks apart after Franco dies. Yeah. And do do you find that, I mean, that that was a very good summary of like a really complex history. (laughs) Thank you. Do you find that Spain is like sort of an ideal case study because of this, all these moving parts, or do you find it's, it's so complex to untangle that it, that it's more challenging than it is helpful? (laughs) Oh, I think, I think both. I mean, I'm one of those people who think that any any country is a good case study because mm-hmm. you know history works differently in different places, and so you look for commonalities and differences, and then try to explain those. And yeah, Spanish history is incredibly complex, but I think if you take any nation's history or any region's history, you're going to find out it's more complex the the deeper you dive into it. It's just mm-hmm. that most people know so little about Spain that it seems complex. And well, yeah, it's a good point. And is the the flamenco thread of this, is this choosing a thread or choosing an access point, is this um, the most beneficial way of kind of getting at these different uh, identity formations? How did you... It is for me. Mm. I, again, I think that people think dif- in different kinds of ways. And I tend to think thematically. And I tend to be a big idea person. And I love people who are really detail oriented. I'm not that kind of person, but I totally admire what they do. And so I I just think you can get at these problems in different sorts of ways in this place to my strengths. Yeah. Getting at a theme. And so is there much dancing as the, you know, you, they lose these Imperial battles, the country falls into civil war. Um, it, do the cafes cantantes continue? Do they stay open? Are there still concerts and does life go on? Well, a little bit. A lot of them do end up closing down in, you know, after the Civil War. And in, in this, during the Civil War, you've got some places where they're still functioning. But after the Civil War, not so much. They do begin to grow again in the late 40s, I would say and then certainly in the 1950s, and then those things become promoted under uh, the tourist regime from Hmm. the late 50s on. Um, But, you know, people are always going to dance and sing in their own homes. It just may not be as commercialized. You also get these groups of people who go on international tours. So it's continuing, but it's definitely frowned upon uh, by at least elites for these things to actually exist, even though they still do but they're not nearly as popular in the 1940s. But again, in the 1940s, you've got so many people starving at this point that entertainment is not going to be had by many people unless they're pretty wealthy. And uh, so Franco comes to power and stays in power, you know, which is kind of extraordinary considering Europe post World War II. Um, and I, so, so the Iberian Peninsula is like kind of this outlier in world's politics and everything. Um, what, was, what was it like under Franco and, and how do you see this construction of Spanish national identity coming from the, the you know, the rubble of war? What, what do you what do you mean when you say what was it like in Franco Spain? What exactly? Are you so, so what you kind of described how there were these many different moving parts trying to create a nationalism. And then all of a sudden you have a a side that, that is victorious in the war. Um, I imagine, you know, and this is kind of what we've seen in the Balkans with national identity construction is, you know, you don't just forget that your son died in the war or whatever, fighting for this cause that no longer exists. Ah, yes. Okay. So how, how do these, how do people come to terms with that? And, and of course, what, what role does flamenco play in it? Well, I don't think that flamenco plays a, very much of a role in, in that question that you're asking. Mm. I think it's outside of that. What happens after the war is you have a reign of terror for a very long time so mm. that people are cowed. Um, and people, of course, remember they're dead, but they're not allowed to remember they're dead. They're not even allowed to mourn uh, that publicly they're dead. Mm. Um, they're not a lot of death certificates aren't actually created for those people who are missing in war. So 
women couldn't necessarily remarry or anything like that. And people were punished if they fought on the wrong side of the war. So mm. what you end up having is terror followed by famine. Mm. Um, and basically I called this in an article I wrote a war of occupation that lasted for a very long time. Mm. And in fact, it's only, and in fact, to get to the sort of transition to democracy, you have what is known as the pact of forgetting where people are not going to be prosecuted for war crimes or anything like that. And that's why in the 2000s, all of a sudden, you've got all of these people who, whose relatives fought on the Republican side, asking for justice, asking for all sorts of things, um, where they're talking about digging up grave, mass graves and trying to identify them. All of these sorts of things are occurring in the 2000s. It's only now that they're beginning to deal with the wreckage of the Civil War. Hmm. And the way that the nationalists dealt with the question of national identity, of course, is through terror, through the fact that people who went to school, you know, had to be educated in uh, Catholicism, that women, young women had to go through uh, the auxiliar, auxiliario social, which is part of the uh, feminine section of the phalange. It was basically, they had to be trained how to be young women and how to serve the state, the newspapers, of course, and uh, TV and all these things were avenues of propaganda to try to create a nationalism. It was very heavy handed. Hmm. And does that, does the heavy handed creation of a nationalism work? That's a good question. Uh, because you have to get at what were people really thinking. Mm. I, I would say it didn't necessarily work because when he dies and you get the transition to democracy, you get a lot of people who express opinions that are very different from the ones that they were fed throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Mm. And I, I'm very interested, maybe we can lighten it up a little bit. I'm very interested in this uh, because it is, and it's just so fascinating. And, I, you know, um, but maybe we can talk a little bit about this tourist regime you talked about and, yeah. and sort of, yeah, something that I'm familiar with just growing up. And that's kind of what we imagine Spain to be here in America. Where does this come from, the tourist regime? Yeah, I, I, well, it, it was... You know, you had the tourist boom in Europe in the 1970s, and Spain wanted a piece of that action. And so in the early 1950s, they began to, I mean, it's not like they didn't have a tourist board before, they did, but because of the war and everything that had, had fallen apart. And so by the time you get the European tourist boom, right after World War II, after this sort of growth of consumer culture in the United States and in Europe, the tourist industries across Europe and the United States started growing and, and um, Spain wanted a piece of the action as well. And Spaniards knew that the Franco regime and people in the tourist board there knew that, knew that they could make a lot of money selling Spain. And they did this in many kinds of ways um, by one of the things that they did, uh, Neil Rosendorf has a good book on this, uh, was this kind of soft diplomacy of, of tourism they made uh, they went to Hollywood, for example, and they invited Hollywood directors to film movies in Spain on the cheap. So you get movies like El Cid and Dr. Zhivago and a lot of the spaghetti westerns that are that are filmed in Spain. So that's one way they start getting money in. And they realize that a lot of people like Spain and they're curious about it. And as I said, this 1964, 65 World's Fair was a big push to talk about Spanish tourism to get people there. The Spanish pavilion in 1964-65 in was one of the most visited pavilions and they had in their, you know, famous books, uh, famous pieces of art from the Prado, famous contemporary art by uh, people like Dali, and they had dances and all sorts of things to show Spanish culture. And then of course they had a little tourism room I think it was upstairs in their pavilion where people could go. And, and this created an incredible tourist industry at that point. Hmm. And, yeah. they, and then they took some of those exhibits from the 64, 65 um, fair. And they, then they sort of put them on a worldwide tour called Expo Tour. And they just brought in the tourist money. Wow. And I always find it so fascinating that, 
yeah. it's something that you know they still exist the world's fairs but they they've really lost the the sort of grandeur that they used to have right. but they're they're so important and they come up at these just like incredible <laughs> historical moments and uh, it, they used to be quite a spectacle. So that's very interesting to hear that that's sort of like a moment. And that's in, in New York. Yeah. The other big one there that I would say for Spain was in 1889 in Paris. Mm. Because it was there that you had a, a flamenco show, the Gypsies of Granada, they were called. And they were a big sensation. And um, the composer Debussy saw them. And he was totally taken by the 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 music that they were playing and he then got together with spanish composers and said you need to really look at the roots of this kind of music and incorporate it into your own music and so spanish composers like manuel de falla did these kinds of things and so you get this the spanish avant-garde beginning to put their imprimatur on on flamenco music or at least what they called the cante hondo as something that was incredibly important and part of Spanish the Spanish heritage, and so that's what I'm talking again about a feedback loop. You have these European composers who look at these Spanish works of art and say this is good, and they tell the Spaniards and Spanish, yes, this is good, and so <laughs> let's promote it some more. And, and that was another time you had that happen. And one thing that's come up a couple times in this conversation and seems important and um, uh, definitely a controversial issue in Europe is, is gypsies, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so how do they play into this whole s story? Yeah, that's, that's uh, something that I only touch on in my book mm. because it's, it's, it's almost like, it's like breathing. It's always there and you don't notice mm. it necessarily. So... Uh, Lou Sharn and Deutsch writes about the Spanish gypsy as a cultural construction. Whereas it, it's very different from what people consider real life Roma people or gypsies. Mm. In Spain, they call themselves gypsies. So I tend to use that term. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this real difference between you can like their artwork, like their performance and say, this is great stuff, but you'll have people saying, but you don't want to actually have anything to do with real gypsies. <laughs> Uh, so it's this strange kind of combination. But again, I can see that you can do that. You can think about this in the United States too. African American culture is foundational to United States culture and, and it's exported worldwide and people love it. Mm -hmm. And yet we have serious racial divisions in our country. Mm. When you sort of separate this cultural production from the people who are actually producing it you're going to have a different sort of analytical frameworks to deal with those. Mm -hmm. And then it's also not, not only just the separating, but also it's the sort of like then championing it as your own. Exactly. And appropriating it. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. And then are, are there also African influences as well? Yes. At least that's what people say. Um, uh -huh. Certainly, certainly North African. And then there are people who are now making the argument that, there was actually interchange between, this is now in the, in the early 20th century. Well, no, actually, in the origins, they also talk about like Afro-Caribbean roots of flamenco. Hmm. And then again, in the early 20th century, that there are certain jazz influences on flamenco. Um, some, one, one writer has discovered that some flamenco dancers in the late, in the early 20th century were performing and using jazz hands in their performances. Hmm. So there's this certain, there's definitely interplay. And there's also interplay between the continental, Euro, other parts of continental Europe and Spain. It's, it's a art form that is not purely Spanish or purely gypsy or anything like that. It's in constant flux and it has been influenced and it influences Latin America, the United States and other European countries. And that's the other kind of fascinating thing about it. Yeah. And it's, it's, seems to be very useful to talk about these cultural forms going beyond you know we we all kind of start with this the development of uh, imagined communities and you know even when i'm teaching on nationalism we talk about how print is so important mm -hmm. um and the written word but 
but here you're taking something that that is really experienced mm-hmm. um, and and it's really easily exportable I guess maybe even more than the printed word because you what does it take you know dancers and musicians can go abroad so uh, how far into the present do you go with your book well in my coda I go to the present present Ah. The the actual analysis really ends at, with the death of Franco in 1975. Hmm. And the reason for that, so I go from 1800 to 1975. And the reason for that is because things changed so dramatically in the 80s and 90s with the with sort of world music, the internet, all sorts of things. And the fact that, you know, Spain is part of the EU. And so they're just a whole bunch of different kinds of other issues to deal with that would take more books. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. And it becomes, uh, uh, well, this is an interesting sort of question here. Does it, does it become a m- almost more global story or do you still see it um, entrenched in the regionalisms? Because anyone, like you mentioned earlier, who's been paying attention has seen the sort of uh, issues going on in Catalonia. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see Spain as sort of having more of the same or do you think the global influences are changing it in ways that we haven't seen before? I think both are going on at the same time. Mm. So if you're just talking about flamenco specifically, it is now part of the UNESCO. It's considered a UNESCO world intangible heritage site. Uh, or site yeah. Or, well, is that what it's called? Or called? Yeah, I know it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And Andalusia claims that, and Andalusia, Andalusia, mm-hmm. they uh, they have these big flamenco festivals, but and they have their own they have their own autonomous government that deals with with you know giving money for the study of flamenco and performances and all of these festivals. But you also have the national tourist board that promotes it as well. So it's happening on these different levels. Andalusia is trying to claim it more so, solely as Andalusian, but hmm. the Spanish tourist board is making it more national. So it's, it's still in constant flux. And then of course you have these various fusions of flamenco with other kinds of things. You know, you can look early on at Paco de Lucia and um, Aldo Miola, right? They were doing their jazz flamenco fusions together across the world. And you're getting more and more of this kind of thing across the world as well. So it's, it's happening at all the different levels, the local, the regional, the national, the world. And uh, all this study, one thing that I usually ask about that I actually was negligent on is, is sort of methodology. You mentioned talking to a lot of people and um, you know, you kind of start with that, that really uh, a great quote, flamenco doesn't have a history. It's a dance. Um, oh, you've my book already. Well, no, actually, I, well, because it's not released yet, but Google Books has the intro scan. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, yeah, and so so I did get my hands on the, the intro, but I just love that right away, you know, that was a perception that you were dealing with. So kind of how did you approach getting a history of a dance? Mm-hmm. And do, do you have more sort of like funny, funny stories like that one? <laughs> That's probably my funniest that I love that I put there. I was just like, oh man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I was trying to get my visa to to do research in Spain, that's what she said to me. <laughs> uh, what? So I'm sorry. Your question again? Yeah. So my question was how how does one um, compile the history of, of a cultural activity like a dance? Something that it's not so easy as going to an archive and paging oh, right. the okay. newspapers, you know. Yeah, you're basically talking about sources. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it was difficult. And, and one of the critiques that people will probably lodge against this book is like, I'm not getting at what the, the real people are thinking, the people who are actually seeing these performances or who are performing it because they didn't necessarily write about it. But what I ended up doing, what I first noticed when I was trying to do research on flamenco is how people were avoiding talking about it. Mm. <laughs> and you could, I was figuring out that they weren't liking it because they were either mentioning it in disparaging terms or trying to promote something else. So at first I started like looking at negative space to figure out where flamenco was. But then 
I started looking at, of course, newspapers as a big source that I ended up mm. uh, working with. Um, tourist brochures, mm. religious tracts, pastoral letters, things like that. I was getting at which, and and then uh, various writers that wrote about these performances at world's fairs. I looked at a lot of world's fairs, archival material. Mm. So those kinds of things. And I could get at it that way, you know, critics who talked about performances or memoirs of, of people who were either at the performances or were performing. I mean, there's a lot written on flamenco from people who were performers, especially in the 1950s, but they tended to be these, the kind of like celebrity profiles as opposed to, Mm. thing that was analytical that I could get my my hands on. And one of the things that you notice from the cover, and I'm sure is in the printed tourist materials and advertisements and things like this, is the sort of, uh, and you mentioned passion and stuff, the sexualization of the dancers. Mm-hmm. And so, so how is flamenco normally portrayed? You've seen a lot of ads for it. Yeah, it's always portrayed, I mean, almost always portrayed as a kind of sexualized, passionate thing. And and if you actually look at the lyrics to the things people are singing, it's a lot about pain and suffering. <laughs> Much more aligned with the blues, I'd say, than anything else, ter- lyrically speaking. It's, yeah. it's about uh, people's lives who are, people who are living in misery and trying to overcome that misery by, through singing. Mm. And then I'd say that the dance form is the thing that people are always attracted to because it is, you know, it is attractive and Mm. it is very sensual. And And that's what they lodge on and they think, oh, it's a sexualized performance and this this must be very sexy things that they're singing about. Well, if you actually listen to the lyrics and understand them, you realize that it's rarely dealing with things like that. And what about as far as like outfits and costumes and and the sort of... uh the setting up of the space and, and things like that. It, it, do you find that as time went, it started to sort of play into this um, characterization of itself? Or? Yeah, I think it became very stereotyped. I mean, I think that's changing now some too, but especially in the 1950s and 60s, this, this became, it became folklorized in many respects. I, I said that this is an urban tradition for the most part, but it, the, the, the skirts and dresses became flouncier and the, the, you know, the flowers and the hair and all that stuff, it, it got to what you might call a, a kind of kitschy portrayal of the music. And that has changed considerably since, the, since the 1975. And if you ever look at like the Carlos Saura films, Flamenco, and then another one I think is called Flamenco Flamenco, mm-hmm. uh, you can see how flamenco performers have changed in terms of the way they set the stage or how they how they dress but a lot of times the staging is similar in that you have the the dancers in the front the the singers and the guitar players behind kind of flanking the the dancers that hasn't changed so much but the kinds of things people wear has changed a lot and going into the present day is this is flamenco still a sort of thing that uh say american on study abroad would would end up doing or is it something that you see at the spanish cultural events what is its place today i know it's a little out of the range of the book but and oh no it's still i mean i i would always tell people to go see a performance because even the most stereotype performance is better than anything you're going to see most of the time it's it's pretty amazing to watch mm. and so yes and and the fact is that especially in the big cities in the tourist part touristed parts of town you will get an onslaught of propaganda and people trying to get you to go to flamenco <sighs> shows and you'll go to, you know, if you go to the most touristed parts of town, not if you go to where most people live, but the most touristed parts of town, you might go in and sit down in a restaurant and have um, a placemats with flamenco dancers and bullfighters on them. Mm. So they're playing that, that sort of thing up, the, a kind of banal nationalism, if it, you know, to use the phrase. But is it something that like a, a Spaniard would go and, and see, or is it just a kind of like touristic activity now? No, there are, it depends again. Yes, you have Spaniards who would see it. Certainly more in the south of Spain who will see them, but they won't see them in these these touristed places. They'll see them in, in other kinds of places. It is, yes, 
people still will see it. Now, people who live in, in the Basque country, maybe not so much. Mm. But in southern Spain, in Madrid, pe- there are still people who are big aficionados of flamenco. And, and if they know where to go, they will go. And, and those, you can, those classes fill up in Madrid and in southern Spain if you want to learn how to dance. And and now is it sort of like jazz where where it's just a kind of globally accept or socially normal and yeah, it's totally integrated now. I'd say yes and no because oh. you'll still talk to Spaniards. They'll say, "I'm always amazed that flamenco is something that people think that think of us people <laughs> think of us in this way," but it's true they do, and but yeah, I mean. It is like jazz in that it is accepted in, in those kinds of ways and has become globalized. But not everybody who lives in New York City or um, other, or you know, New Orleans, that everybody's going to be a jazz fanatic. Right. And so, where does one go from this? I mean, it's it's you're at that point where now your book is coming out, and you know, you it's a great accomplishment. And uh, what's next? I mean, I can't just rest on my laurels. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's certainly, a, in fact, that would be a, a constructive next step, I think. Yeah, well, I, I do want to take a little break, but I've got a couple of projects I'm looking into. One has to do with this group uh, called Flow 6x8 that I talk about in my conclusion. They are activist flamenco dancers and singers in southern Spain when the the Great Recession hit them, and the banking crisis hit them. They started doing these flamenco flash mobs in banks <laughs> and singing these contemporary lyrics about why is you know the World Bank and why are these corrupt Spanish politicians messing with our lives? And they just go into the middle of a bank and start doing these dances or songs. And they've been doing this kind of flamenco activism in parts, of, mostly southern Spain, but other parts as well. <laughs> And then another thing I'm looking at is um, possible relationship between African-American writers, um, writers at this point, maybe others, and links or links that they think they have with gypsies in Spain. This is really just something I've barely begun thinking about. Uh, Yeah, it's fascinating. All of these areas, um, and especially Spain, I mean, I think the interest is definitely there in America. And I think um, anytime people get exposure to Spain, I, it always seems like there's this fascination and, and I want to learn more. Cut, have you been there? I have indeed. And in fact, I, I, I walked the Camino Ingles, um, which are not, uh, it, there's so many parallels with this story of flamenco because the Camino de Santiago is sort of like, resurrected as this nationalist tourist yeah and much of that started in the same period under franco as the flamenco stuff the the real promotion of it and yeah and the parallels are just extraordinary with the unesco world heritage and the sort of Mm -hmm. like the attachment to continental europe and and tourists coming from all over and then seeing the real spain quote unquote you know even though Yeah, so so it's fascinating, and I highly encourage, yeah, I think Spain's kind of an overlooked destination because a lot of people are just focusing on, on the major sort of few days in the city or whatever, which is just not enough. Um, yeah, although people, it is one of the most touristed countries in, in no. Europe. Hmm. Yeah, actually, even in the world, it really is it's surprising to me, but it's true. And is it mostly Europeans, or is it a global... I think it's mostly Americans oh, and Europeans. Very interesting. Um, great. Well, we're get, we're drawing close to the hour here, and uh, it's time for which is like sometimes my favorite part is the suggestion. It can be anything uh, anything you like. What would you suggest to the um, hour of history listeners? All right. Well, it's it's kind of two things, and they seem like they're opposite, but <laughs> <laughs> that's legal. <laughs> <laughs> One is. Try to be kind to people, be as kind as you can, especially in these times where there are many unkind people. I think it's a quality that is underrated. Awesome. And the other thing is dissent when you can, that's also underrated. Ah, so can can you give me an example of, um, well, I think we know kind, but you could give me an example of both. 
that works. Like a positive. Um, I think, I think people are just getting battered a lot. Well, I'll just say, in, mm. in like, I'll, I'll just take the, the closest example because it's uh, in academia. I think a lot of people tend, and I, I mean, that seems really banal because you should be kind to everybody around you, but I'm mm. just, now I'll just be academic here, but <laughs> it can be pretty cruel to one another. And oh, yeah. I think you're actually going to get more out of people with in all walks of life if you're kind to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think to, to go into dissent, I think it's really important right now to dissent mm. because people are taking abnormal things as normal. And as somebody who has studied 1930s Europe a whole lot, I know how danger it is, dangerous it is when you don't comment on the abnormal all the time and push back against it. If you don't push back in, against the abnormal and dissent, you will more and more abnormal things will become normalized for people. And I think that's where we begin to dehumanize one another, which again is where kindness comes in. Mm-hmm. You're kind to people, you're you're humanizing them as opposed to dehumanizing them. Yeah. Awesome. Both fantastic. And I think uh, I myself too uh, spend a lot of time in the 1930s with my work and what an important period, especially for now. Um, Yeah, great suggestions. My suggestion is totally regional, so it will not apply to most of the audience, you know, because we have people listening from all over the world. But if you are in Washington, D.C., Every Friday now, starting from last week until the end of summer, they have jazz in the garden at the National Gar- uh, Gallery of Art. Nice. And yes, and you see just people from all walks of life coming to this national public garden and listening to music from all over the world. Last week was uh, Brazilian fojo. Um, which was something new to me, but there were dancers there and it was fun to watch and um, highly encouraged if you're in DC on a Friday. That sounds great. Perhaps next week we'll be flamenco. Yeah, there you go. Um, And your book uh, is Flamenco Nation, the construction of Spanish national identity. And it's out June 11th, correct? Yes. Awesome. Read it. (laughs) Yes, please do check it out. Uh, Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, I just enjoyed our time together. Thank you very much for inviting me to have this conversation. Great. Yes. And and thank you for for chatting with me. I encourage everyone to check it out. And those links, as always, are at hourofhistory.com. On Hour of History, it's our world anytime, anyplace. So long. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out our recommendations page at ourhistory.com forward slash rex. That's ourhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. There you'll find links to the books mentioned during the podcast. And if you choose to purchase one, you'll be supporting the podcast in the process.
And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, make sure you head over to the Hour of History blog found at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog with articles being released fairly often on topics relating to those covered in the podcast as well as others. With that, we conclude this episode and hope to have you back for the next one. Take care. And again, thanks for listening to the Hour of History podcast.